Hello again everyone and welcome to Stitch Bliss Corner. Mary Rose here. Uh, now I'm here today to talk about Portuguese cross stitch uh, but there isn't a lot of it so I'm covering the island of Madeira and which is off Portugal and also the various Portuguese stitching styles uh, and this is as a result of Lily at 42 Stitches who asked me a question about Portuguese cross stitch and um, spoke about the Castelo Branco and Madeira, the island of Madeira and the stitching style that came from there and she also mentioned that uh, her aunt has done quite a bit of wool cross stitch um, and also yes her mother does excellent crochet so I've got it's quite a mixed bag that I've got here and uh, it I'm going to try and make it relatively orderly but it took me from uh, you know uh, bullion stitch and that sort of thing right across to merino sheep it's amazing where a question will take you. So without any further ado, I shall carry on. And I thought the best way to start would be to talk about uh, the location of Portugal. Uh, so um, I've got some maps here. And so we've got France at the top there. And then Spain. And there's Portugal there along that side. And down here is where Madeira is. So I'll have a closer up map of Madeira shortly. And here's a closer up one of Portugal with um, the capital, Lisbon, just in there. Where am I pointing to? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Portugal, capital, Lisbon. Lisbon is the westernmost capital city in continental Europe, 2,700 years old. Lisbon has 400, sorry, is 400 years older than Rome. I certainly didn't know that. Now, Madeira. Oh, I'll, I've got my closer up map later when I talk about Madeira, but anyway. Uh, there is a tiny little thing down there. An autonomous region of Portugal. Madeira is an archipelago comprises a, comprising of four islands off the northwest coast of Africa. It is known for the wine named after it, Madeira, and its warm subtropical climate. The main island of Madeira is volcanic, green and rugged, with high cliffs, pebbly beaches. Uh, the capital Funchal, that's F-U-N-C-H-A-L, has botanic gardens and is known for its harbour and its fireworks show on New Year's Eve. Population more than 267,000 people, and that was in 2011, that information. Right. Let's keep those to the side. Now, this is just some... Por Portuguese embroidery, general embroidery, because Harlequin got stuck into all the research for me, and I think he got a bit carried away with the embroidery picture. So I'm just going to show you some to give you a taste of the variety of Portuguese stitchery. The 
bars, uh, I've got some information about that and the variety of flowers that they used for their work. This is a close-up of the vase that I just showed you. That's sitting right up out of the fabric there. I think that's bullion stitch. Right. Now, Portuguese fiancé kerchiefs. From feelingstitchy.com. When a girl was of marriageable age, she made an embroidered handkerchief out of fine linen and cotton cloth. She used knowledge gained from cross stitch in her childhood. When completed, she would offer the kerchief made with love to the man she chose, and he would show whether he returned her love by wearing it publicly over his Sunday best suit or as a neckerchief. The handkerchief was originally cross-stitched in red and black thread, but it was seen as too long to complete this way, so free embroidery was used instead, and other colours besides red and black were also used. The story of the fiancé's kerchiefs, also known as kerchiefs of proposal, dates back to 17th and 18th centuries and were worked to win their fiancé's hearts usually square 50 by 60 centimetre, linen or cotton and embroidered according to the taste of the stitcher. These proposal wraps represented proof of the stitcher's devotion to the man she was in love with and were offered to him. The engaged male would wear it over his suit and the girls stitched their love and their souls into their kerchiefs. Well, love and soul goes into a lot of stitching, doesn't it? Um, now then, I'll just show you some pictures of these kerchiefs. This looks like a traditional, a woman in traditional dress showing how the kerchiefs were stitched. A reproduction of original cross-stitched kerchiefs. Photo by... Cida Garcia. That looks like it was been done a while ago. Looks like it's got a little little boat there. Maybe he was a sailor or something. The key to someone's heart there. Maybe they were dancers. And I wish I could read that, but I'm sure someone out there will know what it says. Lovely. And this person seemed to be a very neat and tidy person. If she married this man, he would have had a very neat and tidy house. I should imagine. Lovely. Okay. Now I have some pictures here of Portuguese white work. And it's from Portuguese white work, bullion embroidery from Guiamardes, G-U-I-M-A-R-D-E-S, by Yvette Stanton. And that's showing you the bullion stitch. 
we, we, I've done some of those and they're not as difficult as they look really and I'd say online you can find people showing you how to do that now this one here is a foretaste of uh, Madeira work which I'll just show you the style there more of the balloon stitch and it was often worked on on that white too I don't know why but I suppose it does have a crisp look about it and here are some pictures of the women who stitched and their daughters like a bit of stitching history is there right now here's some specific Madeira embroidery and there is a close-up of the island as promised and the history Um, the archipelago of Madeira off the Atlantic coast of Portugal was and is a prolific centre for the output of embroidery. Thousands of women embroidered towels, table mats and other domestic items for sale, not only in Madeira and mainland Portugal, but also overseas, particularly in America. Designs are usually simple, conventional floral motifs and scrolls ladder work may be a feature well it says simple but you'll see it's not my definition of simple for appearance anyway it's lovely a very narrow ladder is made using a stiletto for the holes semicircular scallops are put, worked in the finest buttonhole stitch stitches include running overcast stitch buttonhole and padded satin stitch often worked in pale blue cotton thread as white easily soiled in the climate fabrics included white or Portuguese cotton and so on unlike the embroideries of Spain which had links with North Africa and South America those of Portugal have more affinity with work of the Indian subcontinent characterized by curving scrolls uh, the Indian influence dates from the 15th century when Portuguese explorers opened the sea route around Africa to India. Um, the finest of buttonhole stitches around the edges of items is the main characteristic. Madeira work was copied by other countries. Uh, it was, the island was discovered in the 15th century and it is thought that embroideries began to be produced by the noble women as a need for the decoration of household linens as well as clothing. Handcrafted work done in the convents also influenced the development of embroidery. British interest in this exhibition was so significant that Madeira received an invitation to exhibit in London at the Universal Exhibition, which took place in 1851. Its participation was a great success and items displayed were praised for their purity and artistic perfection. And there's a little bit here about someone who arrived on the island. The hand embroidery of Madeira is generally recognised as being the finest of its kind available in the world. Over the last 150 years, Madeira has collected expertise from the fast disappearing regional centres of hand embroidery across Europe and moulded these various styles into a distinctive package that, in terms of quality of handwork, is unsurpassed worldwide. The story begins in 1860, 
when Elizabeth Phelps, the youngest daughter of a wealthy wine shipper, concerned over the effects of the vine disease Phyloxera, that's P-H-Y-L-O-X-E-R, was having on the income of vineyard workers. So she set out to turn the rural pastime of simple embroidery into a cottage industry. Using her overseas connections and her own skills, mainly in organisation and motivation, she started to sell the work of the Madeira embroiderers to the parlours of Victorian England. So, this is probably what graced the tables of Victorian English nobility. Course they would have had anti-macassars too on the back of the chairs in Victorian homes. The men used to put oil on their hair and um, the anti-macassars were put over the cloth chairs to protect them from the oil in the hair of the men. Imagine embroidering some beautiful anti-macassar or anti-macassar I don't know quite I think the oil may have been from Mac something to do with macassar in the oil I'll have to look that up and let you know next time but I think that's why they were called anti-macassars and you know you can imagine doing your beautiful embroidery and here's this big oil mark on it I think my anti-macassars would have been very simple indeed <laughs> They probably wouldn't have even been edged. <laughs> anyway, here's some more of this lovely work. must have been busy 24 hours a day. Well that's uh, Madeira. So now I'm going on to the embroideries of Castello Branco which another one that uh, was another one that uh, my questioner was asking me about. Back again, sorry I left me Castello Branco in the other room. <laughs> so yes it was something that Lily also mentioned that she was interested in so I thought that I would cover that as well. So Castello Branco. In the 16th century Portuguese embroidery was influenced by Indian sewing skills, multicoloured and embroidery threads already influenced by the Moors, um, like the Portuguese were already influenced by the Moors. At the end of the 16th century, there was a large demand for one-coloured and multicoloured embroideries. These embroideries told a story or were symbols of prestige and wealth. Works from the East were mostly for wall hangings or bedspreads, some quilted, banners and biblical scenes or heroic scenes. The embroidery of Castello Branco has been uh, diversified flora, is a recurrent uh, theme, the peony, the lotus, the chrysanthemum. Well, I mean, the chrysanthemum in particular is uh, very symbolic in Chinese culture and also the lotus in Indian culture, you know, where Buddha received enlightenment under the lotus. Uh, anyway, sorry. <laughs> uh, themes of spring, summer, autumn and winter. The albadara a vase with two handles, which I think I mentioned before, is a frequent theme in the embroidery of the Castello Blanco. 
both in the form of an elegant vase and also a low, wide bowl. The vessel is a symbol of fertility and may be inspired by the theme of the tree of life. The elder Albadara, A L B A D A R R A, Albadara, uh, means a vase with two handles and is a frequent theme in the embroidery of Castello Branco. Can't seem to get my tongue working today. Known to have been in production between the 17th and 19th centuries. The first reference to this local style was made by Jamie Lopez Diaz at the Fourth Congress held in Castello Branco in 1931. He called for a greater recognition of this form of artistic expression as part of the regional heritage. The embroidery is done in silk thread on linen using various styles of stitch but especially the defining slack stitch also known as the Castello Branco stitch. There is no limit to the range of colours, although there are monochromatic examples where the design takes on greater prominence. In general terms, Castello Branco embroidery can be divided into two styles, the popular, with the more obvious designs, and the erudite, more elaborate and complex, and attributed to the upper, better educated classes. Some designs reflect influences brought back from the Orient on the Portuguese voyages of exploration. However, there are also references to daily life, the local flora, flora and fauna, or even just erudite artistic figures appropriate to the respective periods and taken from the Renaissance and Baroque imagery. In some parts of the Castelo Branco district, they are still part of the Pride's Trousseau, shown on her wedding day when the prime at uh, oh, sorry to start again. In some parts of the Castello Branco district, they are still part of the bride's trousseau, shown on her wedding day when the bride and groom open up their homes to the guests. Right. So here's some examples of what I've just been talking about. And there's the Albadara down there. Got a bird there. I suppose that is reminiscent of a of a tree. And I've got some more information here. Castello Branco embroidery is a very exquisite piece of handmade work containing tens of thousands of individual meticulous stitches in pieces of art. In the town of Castello Branco, a pretty place where the trees are lined with orange trees and its citizens are watched over by the protective walls of an ancient castle, a group of women sit in silence at their workbenches. The only sound which breaks this sleepy tranquillity is the constant hollow piercing of tautened canvas, tautened, no, tightened canvas by the embroidery needles held expertly in the women's hands as they strive to protect another valuable aspect of their heritage. From across the square, a church bells peal a fairy tale melody. A jerk. Church bell peals a fairy tale melody. I think that's what that should say. And they just have their hands on some work they're doing there. So thousands of tiny stitches. And here is a picture of some of their thread. Um, and they're all striving to save their traditions there. Uh, 
As one of the women explained, we had two options when we left school, to work the land or to do this. And there's a lady working away there. Now, Castelo Branco is a city in Portugal just north of the Spanish border in central Portugal. And I don't know why I haven't got a picture of the, you know, on the map. I've got everything else mapped, but anyway, not to worry. <laughs> um, it has its own unique style of embroidery. It looks a bit like cruel work in some ways. Uh, the embroidery of Castello Branco brings one word to mind. It is rich. It is rich in colour, design and symbolism. The traditional Portuguese embroidery is worked on the linen ground, traditionally with silk threads. The predominant filling technique used is Ponto Castello Branco. Long satin stitches with a perpendicular thread couched over the satin stitching to secure it. There's another picture of the work. Among the other stitches used in the embroidery of Castello Branco, you'll find satin stitch, stem stitch, long and short stitch shading, uh, chain stitch, French knot, and so on. And then of course they show how they draw out the design ready for stitching. It seems the most widespread application was in decorating bed coverings, which were often part of the trousseau or dowry of a young bride. Today the embroidery of Castello Branco can still be purchased or commissioned, with prices ranging all the way up to €45,000 for a bedspread, depending on the size and design. Have you noticed that the designs are somewhat reminiscent of Jacobean embroidery? The tree of life is a common image as are fanciful birds, animals, flowers, vines and tendrils and fruit. There's some of the exquisite stitchery there. And there's another dear little bird there. Bluebird of Happiness. And what does it say here? In, well, it is like Jacobean in some respects. In other respects, it is quite unique. The abundance of couched over satin stitching is definitely different. And so on and so forth. I've got all this information down below as to who's making these comments. A lot of colour in that. It all seems to work well, which is quite an achievement in itself. And now we come on to the rugs and this was a revelation to me, I have to say, because I wasn't expecting to find this out. Um, the Are Ulash. I think that's how you say it. It's A R R A I O L O S rugs. Areolush is about and it's about 90 miles southeast of Lisbon. That's where this place is. Just there. And Lisbon is over there. That's Lisbon. So there's Ariulush. Um, and I apologise to anyone from the region or who knows how to pronounce it correctly. Uh, I have a great deal of trouble with languages other than my own. And even my own I'm having trouble with this morning, so there you go. Um, 
They're made in Portugal by hand according to centuries-old techniques. The selection of rugs in Portugal is available and rugs can be specifically ordered for colour and pattern. It is believed that Portugal's rug weaving tradition came from the Moors who settled in Areolish, where fertile and grazing land was available. The Moors taught their rug making techniques to local women and the name of the town became synonymous with embroidered rugs. Traditionally, these embroidered rugs were made at home, but increasingly the work has moved to small factories. These rugs do not require a loom, and so they can be made in any size, shape, colour or pattern. There are two grades of stitching used, fine point and gross point. Fine point is more time consuming and allows for greater detail and intricacy of the design and is more expensive than gross point and more durable. Gross point is a type of needlepoint embroidery uh, consisting of stitchings crossing two or more threads of canvas in each direction. Well, I'll just show you what I mean there because I think that's the easiest way because of course gross stitch was for the biggest bigger designs and then if you wanted to do fine point uh, that would make the design more detailed uh, to the eye now I've just got Mary Martin's needlepoint book out um, that I've, I've showed in the previous video floss tube six when I did fabrics Broadway and Hollywood so there's Mary's book there and it's just to show you what she was a Holly well a Broadway star mostly uh, but it's just to show you the difference between gross point and the fine point because it's a lot easier to see it so around her work there around here the fine work that's the gross point and then see where she's done her detail she's done the very tiny stitches and that's the petit point or the fine point. Okay. And she did do a rug, but hers was. Oh, well, I've got that on the previous video. I won't go into that. Otherwise, this video will go on for hours. <laughs> um, now, rugs made during the 17th and 18th century were often rectangular and used four basic design elements. Plants with a variety of flowers, geometric linear designs that were popular, animals and birds, crowns, hearts and amphoras. So here we have just some of the, this is, I've seen Arlene, yes, of course, Arlene Cohen. She's got this book on her shelf, I'm sure I've seen it. <laughs> anyway, so see, here's some designs here of crowns. And, of course, they were big on initials for their handkerchiefs and everything. And here are the Madeira work. Examples there. And the broidery on glaze. I think I'm going to cover that again shortly, but I, I'm not sure, so this is going everywhere today. Uh, there's some broidery on glaze examples there. In fact, I may as well do the embroidery, the embroidery on the glaze now, seeing as I've got my big book here. The needlework book from New Idea. And this is ancient. And embroidery on glaze. It, uh, it's an eyelet work. And you use the blanket stitch to edge, edge it, and then you cut the piece out. 
that's broidery on blouse. Uh, its success is due to designs it prefers. Small, unsophisticated cut-out shapes of leaves and daisies or scattered islets that once were always present on linen curtains, tablecloths and bedspreads. Yes, it used to be very popular, broidery on glaze. Right. Anyway, back to the rugs. During the 19th century, the Napoleonic Wars and the exile of Portuguese nobility to Brazil undermined Portuguese rug making. The industry was revived in the early 1900s by Portuguese artist José de Quiros, who researched ancient patterns and found bright, clear dyes. Rug making spread from Areolas to other towns in Portugal, especially north, near the city of Oporto. Areolas rugs attracted international attention between 1920 and 1940, when Europeans and Americans uh, started to collect them. New design elements based on French uh, and English floral patterns were introduced. Modern rugs were modified in palette and patterns, but most traditional designs are maintained. Several people may work on one rug simultaneously. It takes a fast worker 15 days to complete about 40 square inches of fine point, which has more than 40,000 stitches. During the 17th and 18th century, Portuguese aristocracy listed rugs in their catalogues of riches. The rugs were treasured, hand embroidered on linen backing with beautiful and vibrant colours and intricate patterns. Thousands of women work on rug making in Portugal and you need a sturdy jute backing uh, and you can use elongated cross stitch reinforced by double thickness of all wool yarn covers the canvas. The wool is imported from New Zealand and Australia. So here, and I will show you my attempt at the long cross, you know, the cross stitch method that is mentioned there. Uh, shortly, elongated cross stitch, yes. Now the, here's one of their rugs. quite intricate and geometric. It's got a little bit of the chatelaine about it really, hasn't it? Have a look at that one. Areolus rug from Portugal, 17th century, in the Textile Museum of Washington, D.C. It's hard to imagine the amount of time that would have taken. And here's a very close up of the stitch is used. Tapetes, T-A-P-E-T-E-S, D -E 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 areolos, made from a dense water resistant merino style wool which is hand sewn onto a canvas backing using a form of cross stitch. And a few more examples. And here are the women working on a rug. Well, I don't know. The rug doesn't seem to be an adequate description of it, really. 
and I just <laughs> I just thought I'd show you oh, which do I do first I just I'll show you my little bit of Ariella's rug making stitch I just left those there but I was going to cut this and and you you know to do a sample and I thought well it's still a bag so I'll, I'll leave it as a bag I'll just stitch it where it is but anyway that's the stitch and it's really quite simple to do I'll have the link down below of how to do it and it's addictive I mean, once you get started you don't want to stop and the, the other side looks like that and I think I've seen a long time ago the underside of rugs looking a bit like that but if if you did work on coarse under fabric for your work your hands would be very badly affected at a really you know you'd need good lanolin or something to to protect your hands and then I just thought for the sake of Christine Lou, who, <laughs> a, a, a stitcher, a floss tuber, and she's very fond of sheep. So Christina, this is dedicated to you, this little segment, because I thought the wool might be interesting for you too. Uh, in this region in particular, merino sheep, uh, were the source for the rugs because of its endurance and its quality and many other attributes. So here, here are some merinos. Just look at their fleece. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? And there's a particularly handsome one. Are you watching, Christina Lou? Then here is a picture of the man just showing you the depth of the wool. I'm quite a wool fan myself now, actually, because it's really quite amazing. And here's some information that has been gleaned uh, fleece according to some estimates there are over a thousand breeds of sheep worldwide fine wool less than 24.5 microns medium wool 24 microns to 32.5 microns coarse wool greater than 32.5 microns and the super fine merino fleece typically has a fine crimp and a crimp frequency of approximately seven crimps per centimetre. So that's that. And there's the crimps there. Wool fibres typically have a wave or crimp pattern as illustrated below. Wool staple crimp can readily be seen in wools with good character. Even in wools with poor character or clarity of staple crimp, the individual fibres would generally have a crimped shape. And it's just the shape of the fibre there. So that's getting right into things, isn't it? Now, what else have I got here? Portuguese crochet. Um... Crocheting hats and scarves. Wait till I just have a look at where I got this from. Yes, this is all crochet in Portugal. And this person is basically saying, is it crocheting? 
or is it tapestry in some ways? And she's just shown the church hangings, altar cloths and things, which are exquisite. And then she says, she shows a picture. Uh, crocheted hats and scarves uh, were also in fashion on young and old alike. Since most people crochet in the privacy of their homes, it was not easy to find them, but I did spot a few. One woman was happily conversing with a friend in a park while crocheting a black wool hat. This woman, wearing a crocheted hat and scarf, is crocheting a hat. She passed the wool behind her neck to create proper tension. I was quite fascinated with that picture because she's got the wool around her neck there so to create the tension for her crocheting. So it looks like there's a, a thriving crocheting community in Portugal, which is lovely. Let's see if there's anything else there. No, I think that's it. Those must be the castle walls, the walls they were talking about in Arielis. What a tradition. Then a final little bit about the wool, and that will be the end of this video. I have to apologise for me falling over my words a bit here. I don't know, maybe I haven't got my, my daytime head on yet. Uh, the Phoenicians introduced sheep from Asia Minor into North Africa and the foundation flocks of the Merino in Spain might have been introduced as late as the 12th century by the Marinids, a tribe of Berbers. I think you could get Berber carpets. Although there were reports of the breed in the Iberian Peninsula before the arrival of the Marinids. Uh, Spanish breeders introduced English breeds, which they bred with local breeds to develop the Merino. This influence was openly documented by Spanish writers at the time. Pre-18th century, the export of Merinos from Spain was a crime punishable by death. Right. Well... I hope that helped with the question. Uh, I find out a lot from the questions people put for me to look into. Uh, the only thing is there's always a time lapse between when the question is asked and the, uh, you know, I actually put something up uh, because there's so many things going on. Well, we all know how busy we are all the time doing different things. And, of course, stitching is an absolute priority in this household. Uh, I always was, well, not always was, that's not true, because, of course, when the children were growing up, they were the priority in the house. But um, once they, you know, established themselves, uh, then stitching became very big in my life, uh, as it does for so many of you out there. Uh, so Lily at 42 stitches, <laughs> I hope that has covered most of what you were asking for. Uh, I know it was a bit jangled and I'm sorry about that. Um, anyway, I'm looking forward to the next video. I'm making some progress on the Scout. Um, I'm not showing him this time because he's very similar to he was last time and I'm hoping to have a bit more done on that corner at, at any rate to show you. I've done some work on my frost piece which I shall show you next time and I'd just like to thank you for your support and encouragement, kind words, uh, lovely kind words from so many different people. Uh, it warms the heart to know there are so many people who do such 
great stitching you know what I mean like well we're a quiet group in many ways with our stitching and it's just nice to know that there are other people with the same interests as us <laughs> sorry about that rabbit trail I was just I go down now and again all right then well I shall say goodbye to you all for now and I'll catch you next time at Stitch Bliss Corner